But now I'm not a developer. I was an architect and now I build software. So it's going to be necessarily a bit simplified. I'm not going to take into account the time value of money or complex deal structures like mess debt and you know waterfalls, etc. What I'm going to do is kind of a first principles look at all of the relevant factors that need to be considered uh, and introduce uh, you to how Giraffe allows a real expert to go deep in them. Okay, so let's say we're a developer and we uh, have found an opportunity in this part of Sydney. So the first thing a developer needs to consider is context. Now, context is a very broad term. We can talk about physical context, like what buildings are around. We can talk about economic context, it's in what are the incomes of the people around. We can talk about policy context. What is the government trying to achieve uh, over here? So, for example, in New South Wales and Sydney, where I am, uh, this is all heritage controlled, but there's massive development, new airports and trains out west, whereas over here, it's sort of a more of a sedate, restrained policy direction. Um, at the same time, policymakers in this part of Sydney are trying to you know, create um, affordable housing. Uh, we can look at the incomes, we can look at transport access, we can look at the soil, the geotechnical soil, we can, we can look at sort of almost any uh, spatial data set as, as, a, as context. And most context can be expressed as spatial data. Uh, another piece of context that a developer often likes to look at is the recent sales. Uh, property sales, I'll turn that on. Uh, and this shows, you know, what transactions have happened around our site. And let's say, let's say we've acquired these sites on Crown Street. Okay, so what Giraffe's helping us do is start looking at the context. And I should deep dive into, I guess, the most relevant context, and that's the zoning, because all that other context, the demographic, the policy, the transport, all of that sort of stuff, the department, the Department of Planning, and this is true around the world, Department of Planning, whatever they're called, uh, is factoring it in and is making a response to all of that stuff through the zoning code, which they constantly change in order to respond. So in this, uh, we can see when I turn the heritage off, that zoning, and if I right click on it there, is M MU1, mixed use one. So that is the, uh, now if we dived in and went to the, the legislation, that would tell us exactly what is permissible on mixed use one. Um, but for our purposes, let's imagine that I knew residential and uh, some retail is permitted. Uh, the other piece of policy that we need to um, take into account in Sydney is floor space ratio. This is another very common control around the world and the, the Americans normally call this floor area ratio. So do some of the other states of Australia. And it is the ratio between the site area and the building area. And another kind of policy, a zoning policy that almost every developer needs to consider is height of building. And you can see here's uh, the San Francisco zoning map is being bought in. And look, there's some height districts. So they've also got height controls in sunny San Francisco. Okay, so let's go through them now. So um, our height control is 18 meters. Now, a typical floor to floor is roughly three meters. So that's about six meters, six meters, sorry, six levels, six times three being 18. Typical floor to floor is actually sort of 3.2, so we may struggle. But let's turn off that height of building and let's turn our floor space ratio. And it's 2.5 to 1. So what that means, and let's draw a boundary to make this point, our area, our site, I'm, I'm roughing it in for now because at this point of the process, everything's roughed in. Our site has an area of 1,892. Call it 2,000 square meters. So we're allowed 2.5 thousand square meters of built form. And that's the floor space ratio control in New South Wales. Now it's gonna be slightly less because we are slightly less than 2,000 square meters. Okay, so we've got what, what would be described as uh, some contextual analysis. I'm gonna save this project. Now, my development firm is called Portfolio Enterprise and um, this project is 105 Crown. Now, often, if you're a developer, you're working across multiple opportunities at the same time. So you may want to track a lot of them by value and by 
status and by sector. And let's say this is what we're trying to do over here. So I'm just putting that in so I can track it later. And giraffe kicks me out and then kicks me back in. Okay, all right, so let's turn off the stuff that we don't need for now. Property sales, floor space ratio, and we'll leave the cadastral path as one. And I may actually bring in an imagery layer. Imagery is maybe the developer's best friend or any kind of urban analyst's best friend. Okay, I don't know Metromap in this, in this workspace, so I have to use the New South Wales public imagery because the imagery tells you sort of everything, what the roof's made of, what the neighbours are doing, what the setbacks are, where they're trees, how many lanes the road has, how busy the road is. Um, and I'm just going to see if I'm using the correct network, which I'm not. I'm on my 4G instead of my 5G, and I've just switched across to 5G. So with a bit of luck, we'll pick up some speed. Um, so this imagery, especially if it's recent, is incredibly powerful and useful. And normally, you can tell exactly what's going on, especially as an experienced developer just with the imagery, you can tell what the zoning is, you can tell these are residential row houses, you know how tall they are, you can see the setbacks, the ratios of hard space to soft space. So for example, our site has no trees, no green, so the water just runs straight off it. So always get that imagery on. And then think like a detective, look at everything. You know, this is telling you almost everything you need to know. Uh, but it's good, it's good to get the heart of building so you can you know argue with council and, and know exactly what you're talking about. All right, so we've got now a sort of a, a context about these buildings. And for the purposes of this example, I'm going to pretend that these buildings have been tragically destroyed in a fire. And so I'm going to filter them out with a, with a geometry, which I'm going to draw. Make it a bit bigger. Get rid of them properly. There we go. And you, my son. There we go. Done. And just make that. Full. Okay, so here's our site. All right, and now the f I guess the, the fun bit of the project begins, or fun for me, and that is the marriage between the form, the shape of the building, and its performance. And because we are being a developer right now, we are considering performance as financial performance. And uh, the job is pretty simple. We're going to sell square meters of space. Some of them are apartments. Each apartment, say, has 140 square meters of it. We're going to sell it. We're going to sell those apartments at a certain amount. So, say it's a million dollars for a hundred square meter apartment. That's ten thousand dollars per square meter that we're selling these apartments for. And we're going to have to build them at a certain cost. So, the concrete, the structure, the design, the interest payments, the taxes, the fees, the marketing costs. You take all our costs and measure them per square meter, well, we're gonna to wanna to be building for less than we're selling. And the difference is gonna be spent in two ways. The first is it's gonna be spent on the land, and the second is it's gonna be our profit. Now this lump of space that we're building, uh, it has to con comply or at least respond to all of these contextual controls that we've identified. So I'm gonna show you how I would start off with this, all right. And I guess the first thing we do is we know from the macro conditions or from experience or from other projects we're doing what we're selling for and what we're buying for. So we can figure out what we're selling for by going to realestate.com and seeing how much an apartment costs in this area. And we can sort of say, well, we're building luxury and what's new and what's old and how big. And we can argue with our marketing team about what the future demographics is it one beds, is it two beds. And so we, we can, I would start off by setting the product type. So we think in this area, maybe it's going to be 30% one beds and 70% and two beds. And we're not going to do any three beds because in this area, the demographics you know, are not suitable for it. And the one beds are going to be quite big, nice 70 square meters. And the two beds are also going to be nice big, 110 square meter, two beds. Um, so that's the mix. And now the price, we can say, all right, these one beds, we are going to sell them for, this is Sydney, remember, $850,000 is an absolute bargain. And the two beds, 1.1 million. One, two, three. Okay. And now the final thing we need to sort of understand is the efficiency, as in we're going to build a bunch of building, but some of that building is going to be corridor, and some of that building is going to be lifts and stairs that no one's going to buy. They're going to expect to be there. They're going to need them, but they're not going to pay for them. And so only a certain percentage of our building we're actually going to sell. 
Uh, and that's what these two efficiencies signify. The first efficiency is what the uh, council counts as floor space, because the council doesn't uh, count a, a lift as floor space. And that's coming back to this floor space ratio. And the second is our sort of commercial efficiency, our sell efficiency. What percentage of the building can we actually sell? And in this, in this instance, it's, we're going to say 72%. It could be higher. It could be lower. If it's a really tall, thin tower, it's probably going to be lower because the structure and the core are going to take up more space, relatively speaking. And if it's lower, it's going to be more efficient. So once I'm happy with these assumptions for residential, I'm going to hit save. And now what we're going to do is we're going to so we've got started with the numbers, and like I said, what we're trying to do is get that interplay between the shape and the numbers. We better make some shapes. Uh, and the first shape I'm going to do is I'm just going to right click and I'm going to um, create the boundary and I'm going to make it retail. Because what we're going to do is we're going to do the ground floor retail. And then on top of that ground floor, we're going to do some residential. I'm just popping it on the top by hitting E to increase the stack order. Now, residential, you can't have a 30 meter deep uh, residential. You can see this from this side to this side, it's 30 meters because after about eight meters from the facade, there's not a lot of natural light and there's not a lot of air movement. And what that means is you get black mold and sadness. And so residential buildings are thin. They're thin. They normally in Sydney, at most about 20, because then you can have a two meter corridor in the middle, eight to the left, eight to the right. So eight plus two plus eight is 18. And then there's some notches you can put in and balconies for that final two. And so 20 meters is about right. Uh, Whereas if you look at sort of commercial towers, they can be much bigger and much deeper. If we could fly across to Barangaroo, and let me just out, uh, turn the outlines on, on the um, building so you can see them clearly. Barangaroo, I think, is about 30 meters, 30, 30 meters deep, right? So you can sort of tell just by looking at it, that's not a residential building, it's not a residential floor plate. Next door, we do have residential, and it's about 20 meters wide. All right, so we're going to do thin residential buildings. And so when you're doing thin, generally as a design, you want to wrap, you want to maximize the length of your thin snake because that's going to maximize the area. And so we wrap something like this, which is why you get these courtyards. So now there's windows here, windows here. This this like cut that lets light and air into this floor plate. And if you are a creative architect, there's, like, there's lots of ways you can sort of do this. You can, you can think about things creative cuts and slices and all sorts of things, Superman S, to, to solve that light and, and air access problem. But the traditional method is this sort of either courtyard or notch. And so for an early stage feasibility, let's do that. Okay. Okay. Now, what Giraffe's doing is as I'm drawing, it's it's doing the calculations uh, that I need to do in order to make sure that I comply with that contextual analysis I did at the start. Now, if you remember, we did this height of building analysis. If I turn everything down, it's 18 meters is our maximum height. Now, a feature raft calculates the maximum height by adding up you know, all of the floor to floor heights of each product type and it returns them to us. So we can go up like that to get to 17 meters. Now, once we've done that, we are at an FSR of 3.68, which if you recall, is bigger than 2.5, which is what we're on to. Now, the reason it looks so high is because I've drawn this big slab of retail underneath. And we better put some value on the retail as well. See, I've actually got a net rent figure already, and I've got an efficiency of 90% and a sell efficiency of 85%. So I'm saying of that 100, Sorry, that 1,892 square meters of retail, 85% of it is being rented at 250 a square, a square meter. But what we're going to need is we're going to need some underground car park, and we're going to need an entrance into that. And maybe what we're also going to need is uh, a through site link. 
that allows the people to walk from Crown Lane to Crown Street. And as we do that, our FSR is going to drop, but not significantly. So now we have a choice. Okay, so we can do some things like provide some setbacks so that the people in these apartments are not uh, absolutely hard onto the street. What's nice about that is that the buses, the noise sort of is attenuated somewhat. And we can lower the number of levels and then put, put them back on, but pull back to make some beautiful terraced gardens. And we can use this kind of excess uh, area that we've somehow managed to achieve to create like a really nice, uh, some sculpting of the building. So we're using that policy area, that policy kind of to our benefit if we can. Um, I'm stacking and unstacking this building right now. There we go, making some really pyramidal forms. The forms of like a, uh, what are those things in Peru? Montezuma was in? Anyway, I'm blanking on it. You know what it is, the step pyramid, Aztec step pyramid. And we're going to put some terrain, like some, you know, foliage over it. All right, so we, we're getting down to the FSR that we, we feel like we should be at. Uh, and maybe a quick way of, of winning is pulling back this retail and um, quite substantially, quite substantially, and building a little garden over here. See, giraffe lot auto populates a billion trees. I'll scale those those guys down with a scale parameter, so they're more little bushes, uh, or else the people will lose all daylight. Um, but that's pretty nice, and I may just do a little row of trees over here just to show the council that I am serious about urban greenery. Cool. Okay, so now we got down to two point seven. We can probably you know, we better had get all the way. You can see how infinitely variable design is because you have literally infinite options on choices to do, on things to do in order to hit that compliant 2.5. And maybe what I would say at this point is, look, we're 2.57. I really like this shape. There's a lot of real of interest here. You know, people can have a good time. Maybe I'll just lower the efficiency and the, this efficiency as well, so that um, I can put some extra elevators. This means people get up and down faster, so I can put in an extra core. And if I've done that, look, you can see I'm I'm in the money. I'm in that 2.5 range that I need to be. And I'm well under the max height, and I look like I'm complying. And I look like I'm being thoughtful. I've sort of put some trees to protect, or I've retained the existing trees to protect against the bus noise on Crown Street, which is this the busier street, and I've got kind of a north-facing garden, north northwest facing garden at least, or probably west, but it will get sun for quite a long bit of the um, the day. And what I'll do is I'll demonstrate that with a nice orange arrow. And so my communications to my stakeholders, either my future tenants or, or, or people that will buy this apartment, to the city, to my financiers, is that I've considered everything that needs to be considered. Um, and I've got a little line to show how this thing gets serviced in terms of um, vehicle in and out. And I can show a rational scheme as in from a design, from a block and stack perspective, it's rational, all the key moves make sense. And from a policy perspective, it's hitting the numbers it needs to in order to achieve uh, what the policy makers were trying to achieve in this area. So now our job is to go and make sure that from a financial perspective, this thing achieves what it needs to achieve for us as developers. And so in Giraffe, we do that through the analytics template. And I'm actually just going to load, rather than building from scratch an analytics template, I'm going to load uh, our metrics, and then I'll go through sort of what's going on. Now, 
the impact here, the number of trees, all of this sort of stuff is interesting. The building area is very interesting. But the, the key thing we're looking at is the feasibility. Uh, and in this instance, I'm saying we're building these things to sell, right? If you recall, at the start, we put in a price of 850000 That's not a weekly rent. It's not even an annual rent. That's a sale price. That's You can sell it. And then on that extremely basic sale price, what I'm going to do is an extremely basic feasibility. And it's got basically three steps. It's got some costs, it's got some income, and it's got an, an analysis of the two. So let's just go through some of the costs. The first is that hard cost. Now, hard cost is a term that Americans use more than Australians. That is the struct, that's the building cost. That's concrete, timber, install, you know, that stuff you have to pay. And it's measured off the gross area. And I've got it set at 2,000 per square meter, which actually is low. So when we're doing this feasibility, because this is in such a nice area, we're going to go for a, a nice finish. We're going to go for quite luxe. So our hard costs are going to be higher. So I'm going to edit our hard costs. So for residential, I'm going to set them to 4,500. And for the retail, I'm going to set them to 2,500 because we're just going to do cold shell and then the tenant's going to come in and fit it out. So maybe we're going to lease this thing to Woolworths or Dan Murphy's. They'll come and do everything. We're just going to put some concrete and like some plugs in there. So it's going to be cheap. All right. So when I hit save, you can see our hard costs have jumped to 24 million. And our soft costs, we're actually measuring soft cost per square meter, which I don't think we want to do. I'm actually going to measure it off hard cost. And I'm going to say our soft costs are 10% of our hard costs, maybe 15. So that's fees, marketing, consultants, all of that sort of stuff. I'm going to save 0 0.5, 15%. 3.7 million and our contingency is our hard cost and our soft cost by a further 10% so that adds an extra 2.8 million dollars so our total costs for this project are 31 million dollars now this is an a massive oversimplification there's no interest costs the time value of money is completely ignored but I'm just baking that into that soft cost so maybe I should say for the soft cost 20% and then I'm assuming that I've, I can structure my interest and my average interest rates over the average construction cost, like is it three years to go, whatever it is, I'm just baking it in there. Um, normally when you study proper, you know, real estate financials, it's very complicated. There's goal seek functions with, you know, money out over time. But this is a simple, you know, should we proceed with this site option? This is a back of the envelope uh, calculation. So our total cost is $32 million. So we think total all in, we can get this thing done for $32 million. Now, our residential sales values are only $10 million. <laughs> So we've got a problem. Um, and that problem is probably in our residential. Well, let's just see the report. We've got uh, 11 one beds and we've got 24 two beds. And, and where that's coming from is, if I go back to the sale option, Uh, we, we, sorry, we're doing the saleable area by sales price. So what I'm going to do is this calculation is wrong. Is I'm going to go residential dwelling uh, price, dwelling total price, and I'm just going to do this. So this is what this is going to do is it's going to calculate that total price from for each dwelling. So you can see it goes to the residential and it adds up each each price. So we're actually making thirty five million dollars. In, in residential um, income over these. I've got three building sections and they make that amount of, of money. So that's good. At least our, our income exceeds our costs. Of course, not significantly. So maybe we can say, look, consider I upped, considering I upped the spec, I made the construction cost a lot higher. I'm gonna up my prices. So let's say I can make a million for the one beds and one four for the two beds. And let's just see what, what are the, uh, and yeah, they were, they were large particular okay, cases. So that's looking more like it. Now we're also making some non-residential sales. So what I'm going to go do is I'm going to get that net rent and the saleable area and 
I'm going to get my that's you know my net rent times the area. So I'm going to make 120 grand, and then that's that's every year. So what I'll do is divide that by a cap rate of 0.5 percent, like of zero of five percent. Uh, so I'm going to sell that that retail asset at a rent of 450 uh, at a cap rate of five percent, which means I, you know the person's going to pay me 20 times the annual rent, and so I'm going to make 2.4 million on that bad boy. Sorry, five million, 2.4 times two because there's two assets. There's that one and that one. All right, so now we're now we're looking good. So our total sales are now 49 million bucks. And so now we just need to do the feasibility. And the way the feasibility works is it brings both of these together um, to calculate the residual land cost. And what it needs to do that is it needs a target return. I'm going to flick across to this series of equations, which I need to look at every time I work this thing out because they're not obvious to me. Um, but what this does is to solve for your return sorry to solve for your return the way that um, you do it is you set your return on cost so we're going to say whatever we pay for the build and the land times the return is going to be our profit and we're going to set that return at 20 percent then our total sales minus the build and land is going to be 20 percent of our build and land and then you sort of you know you factor everything when things cross over the equal sign they become a minus bop, 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 and then you sort of you know land one plus r which is the return total sales minus da, 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 and you get this equation so your total sales minus your um bulked up build divided by that bulk up is what you can pay for the land uh, and that's what i've set for the residual land cost there's that equation so it says look if you pay eight million bucks for the land you are going to achieve a 20% return of eight million of roughly eight million dollars, right? So you can pay for that and make eight million dollars, and so then your eight plus eight plus 32 is going to be 49, which sort of makes sense, right? Because eight plus eight plus 32 is roughly 49, and if you carried all the ones in the it would it would exactly add up. So this then becomes a feasible project. So that's a it's a high return, 20%. But this could be a two, three year project, you know, in which case it's it's an annualized return of say six, seven, eight percent. Um, and there's a huge degree of risk. Uh, but at least what we managed to do is is get an idea that yeah, there's some money in here, especially if you know the the 20% just raw number. Is going to include our interest payments and all those other soft costs. Now, I guess this is where the, the real fun bit comes is it's the optionality, it's the options. Like, this is one option. I'm going to do option two, enhanced, I'm going to call it enhanced. This is when we're going to go to the government, to the council, and we're going to say, what if I were to uh, build a bigger park, public benefit? And in return, you get rid of my height control and my FSR control. So I'm going to copy everything, turn it all off, and paste it in. And just in this, I'm going to configure this so we split it by layer, so we get the default option and the enhanced option. And currently, they're the, the identical because I haven't changed anything. Okay, and then I'm going to start to change. And change, I shall. Okay, there we go. We'll bring that guy in. And we're going to build like a tower. I remember what I said, the floor plates are about 20 meters thick. This tower is going to be about 20 meters thick. And we're going to shape it and chamfer it like this so it reduces its... Uh, so it looks good. And uh, that it's as north-facing as possible. Okay, and I'll just round these corners. Nine too much six great then i'm going to build our nice big park to the north okay and i'm going to tell the government that uh, like this I'm just going to add a base height to this arrow and i'm going to add a type arrow to this arrow close your eyes 
shows you my understanding on this. This is complex. But at least the arrow comes on top of the garden. Um, okay, so we're communicating to the government that we are connecting these two streets together. And we'll still do the retail because we can have this beautiful like, cafe fronting the, the garden, this new park that it's going to cost us millions to do. All right, and currently we're only making a million bucks of profit because there's nothing there. So, And also, sorry, we make a million dollars of profit, but we can only pay a million for the land in option two because our total return is only 14 million. So this guy who's going to achieve, who can achieve 49 and 50 million in sales, he's going to pay 8.2 to the landowner, whereas this guy can only pay 1.8. They still make the same percentage return, but this guy doesn't win the bid because he doesn't get the, the land. So we've got to get a higher value. So if we can do something like this, get a bit more bulk, you know, obviously our return's going to go up. And that's because we're assuming that we're selling this square meters for more than we're making them. We may want to um, just override the efficiency, say for this tower, I'm just going to override that. Um, I'm going to override that sales, that efficiency, sell efficiency. And I'm going to set it down. Yeah, 70 is good. What, what's our default for residential? The 70. So maybe we get, maybe the set comes down to like 68 because it's so tall. I just want to, yeah, that's working. Okay, so you can see as I change the sale efficiency, the, uh, the value of the sales comes up and down. So 67, and then I'll, uh, yeah, oh, that, that's good, because I'm not considering the FSR. We're blowing the FSR out of the, out of the water there. All right, so even though this building is slightly less efficient, it still performs better. Now, remembering, of course, that your total costs, this hard cost is on your gross area. So at a certain point, your efficiencies you know, going to really bite you, but we're not at that point. There's a few, a few tweaks. Okay, so in this instance, you pay more for the land, you make a higher return because you make more sales, even though you donate, you know, a bunch to, to this park, to this park. You may, in this instance, want to add. Well, why don't we do that? Why don't we add a? I'm just going to put the. I'm going to add a new property here called Public Park. And I'm going to set it to one. And I'm going to add a new cost. It's going to be public park. And the unit's going to be in dollars. And it's going to be a million dollars. So it's two million dollars. One, two, three. One, two, three times A. So if, if public park is true, we're going to get... Um, Twenty-one features have public. Oh, it's pulling all the trees. Okay, let's just so get this to landscape. Simple. There we go. Two million. Uh, okay, and now we have the two million for the public park, and I'm just going to edit that total costs so that we add another. We add that public park in plus D. Okay, so now our costs have gone out. But even in this instance, our return is still. That is still 13 million, but the, the land has gone down. And you can see because our return is kind of constant, uh, when I change the park cost, it flows directly through to the land. My return doesn't change, right? Because I've set the return to be the percentage of sales and I'm back solving for the land. So if the public park becomes too expensive, all that happens is the landowner, I can only offer the land 2.6. Right. For me to deploy this capital at a reasonable rate of return, I need I need all of these numbers to you know work like this, and the and the free variable is that residual land cost. Um, so hopefully that gives you a bit of an insight into into the way you can do a, a residential feasibility in Giraffe, do some quick options, and understand kind of the the which levers and which buttons actually have an impact and the kind of impact they have. And again, I emphasize this is a very of a simplified uh, residential feasibility. And there's, you know, obviously a whole bunch of other people that do it in different ways across the world, but this is a, a valid way.